So the, the PCV story I'm going to tell you about today uh, could not have been done without the participation of the USDA APHIS uh, National Animal Health Monitoring System people, particularly Charles Haley and Eric Bush, uh, who, who were instrumental in providing the opportunity to take assessments of the, the total U.S. swine herd. And Suresh Tico at Vito developed a cell line called R1BL uh, that will, as, as time moves on, will become instrumental in being able to understand the virology of circovirus. And the sponsors of the work I'll be showing were the Swine Disease Eradication Center at the University of Minnesota and Berenger Engelheim. And I want to take this opportunity, it's appropriate speaking before an AASV audience, to point out that the lab members who have done the work, Cheryl Dvorak here, uh, a co-presenter, <clears throat> Anne as a third-year veterinary student, Sally is a, an Australian DVM, Marina is a Brazilian DVM, Br uh, Benjamin is a third-year veterinary student, and Mike Ray is a 2013 graduate of the vet school at Iowa State. So it's, uh, I'm, I'm proud to be able to uh, have, to, to, be, to assist in the scientific training of swine veterinarians. Okay. So the, in preparing for this talk and having had some recent experience being asked to do some genetic analyses of circoviruses, I was curious about what the genetic variation, what the circovirus population <clears throat> Of, in the U.S. looked like, because you see these dendrograms, for example, the MPCV2B, where you see five or ten viruses, where you're picking examples of the, the, that demonstrate all the diversity. Any other virus you put in almost by necessity is going to stick out and look like something unique. So I went to our diagnostic lab and asked them for all of the PCV2 sequences they had in their database. And, and of the number they sent back, 917 were of suitable quality to analyze genetically. And I put those into a dendrogram and was amazed by how little genetic variation there was in all of the PCV2 isolate sequenced in Minnesota since 2001. There were, there were no sequences before that time this is a log scale, so there was about one or two sequences in the first two years, a giant spike up to nearly 500 in 2006, and quite a few in the years following. In all of these sequences, there are about 400 sequences of PCV2B from the years 2003 to 2013 that have no sequence variation whatsoever. They're all the same. Similarly, for PCV2A, there are hundreds of sequences over years that have not changed one single bit. No genetic variation. The blue band is all of the, encompasses all of the sequences that are within 2% of the total. And you can see it describes almost all of the sequences that have ever been observed at Minnesota. MPCV2B is one virus out of about 40 in a group that has been observed not only in the last two years, but in 2003 from China and another virus from 1999 in Canada. So I look at this. Almost all of these viruses, less than 2% different. If this were PERS virus, which I know much better, we would say it was all the same virus. It also suggests that anything you do with any PCV2 is the, the results are generally applicable to all PCV2 circoviruses, at least those that circulate in the U.S. today. So, the, so as, as a PERS person who was concerned about circovirus because we're trying to help maintain pig health, solve the disease problems that the swine industry has faced. I was trying to figure out what was going on with circovirus 
in the mid-2000s because things just did not make sense to me. So the, the, we had a great opportunity with NOMS to assess the virological status of the U.S. swine population, and by expressing a capsid protein of the virus, the, the humoral immune response to the virus, and so we, we, we did this general characterization. From the study in 2006, 187 farms. In the questionnaire, no one reported PCV AD, circovirus-associated disease. So to me, we were taking a snapshot of the PCV2A and B status of the U.S. swine herd and the absence of disease. Let's see here. We were surprised to find that circovirus was everywhere. Shown on the left side, her, greater than 99% of herds were positive, and the scale here is the percent of pigs in the herd that were positive. So not only were 186 out of 187 herds positive, in more than half those herds, 80 to 100% of the pigs themselves were positive. The amount of virus shown on the bottom varied with an average of about 10 to the 4th copies per mil, but there were pigs with 10 to the 7th, 10 to the 8th, 10 to the 9th viral loads. Tremendous amounts of virus without patent disease. The antibody response was equivalent to the virological response. This said, says several things. The, you, you just heard from Brian that there are issues with the PCR assay in terms of sensitivity. The absence of a positive result does not mean you're negative. It just means that it, you're PCR negative. But antibody response is a very s sensitive indicator of the presence of a foreign protein in a pig. So if you have antibody responses, I take that as evidence of a history of infection. It may have been cured, but it was there at least at some time. The other thing is that all of these animals with antibody responses still had circulating virus. It suggests that the immune response is not protecting, is not, is not curing the infection. So given that these were finisher pigs greater than 20 weeks of age, let's see. And I'll f complete that sentence uh, in the next slide. The, so the, but here we're looking at the 2A and 2B distribution in those herds. 2B was more abundant than 2A, but there's lots of 2A around. And what I thought was interesting was 9 to 10 percent of the pigs were AB. They were infected with both genotypes. And the levels of virus in the pigs was independent of genotype or single infection versus dual infection. Whether the pigs had genotype A only or B only or A plus B, the average CT values of the PCR assays were the same, and the distributions within those groups were the same. So we did not see any effect of genotype on the level of infection. And again, at the time these samples were taken, none of the producers were reporting disease that they thought was associated with circovirus. Okay. So now we come back to the fact that finishing pigs were positive for virus, often with high levels of virus. The immune response did not seem to be getting rid of the virus. Some of these pigs go on to become gilts and sows and sow herds. So the question I had was, when do pigs get infected? It's not when after weaning do they become seropositive or they become viremic. It's when do they become infected? Because it seemed to me that we had persistent infections here and that those adults ought to be infected. So Cheryl Dvorak did a study where we went out to six 
farms in Minnesota and Indiana and asked what the virological and immunological status was of sows and then following farrowing what was going on in the piglets. We found that, to put it simply, circovirus was everywhere. Sows had lots of virus. There were some sows that were negative, but overall it was easy to find circovirus everywhere. There was no effective parity, so even though there was immunity established in growing pigs, even after three or four or five parities, these animals are still viremic. The virus was shed into the colostrum in the milk, so obviously it's going to go to piglets. The virus is shed in oral fluids, so it's going to be in the environment that pigs or piglets are born into. Okay. So it was no surprise with this information to see that pigs were born with virus detectable in the serum and that their surfaces were covered with circovirus. In fact, 78% of piglets were born viremic. The remaining 22% were born into an environment that was, just, that was heavily contaminated with PCV2. So we conclude from this that pigs are, were infected at birth or shortly after birth. The fact that the sows are infected suggests to me that this is a truly persistent lifelong infection. <clears throat> Non-viremic sows, of <clears throat> which we could find, were, however, producing viremic piglets. The, we had four of the six farms we identified non-viremic sows. Every litter from those sows had at least one viremic pig. So again, this has, there's a caution here that the interpretation of a PCR test is that that sample is negative at the sensitivity that you have. A test that detects 10 viruses per sample is much more sensitive than one that detects 10,000. But those samples are one-fifth of a mill of blood. So you take a 400-pound sow, even if that test is negative at one copy per test, it still does not mean the animal is negative. Okay. All of the circovirus testing that's been done is by PCR, which detects the presence of the nucleic acids. A question which in the early days of PCR always came up was, yeah, but that could be dead virus. How do you know that it's live? It's a more relevant question with circovirus because the DNA genome is more stable. And so one of the things that we wanted to do was establish that this PCR detectable virus is coming from infectious virions. And if you look on the monitors on each side of the stage here, these little green dots are cells that were infected by samples from sow serum, the crate bar, piglet serum, and piglet skin. So we feel that this PCR positive material that we're identifying on sows and piglets in the environment represents infectious virus. Okay. And again, these sows that are loaded with circovirus, that are sharing it with their <clears throat> with their offspring, have high levels of antibodies. High levels of antibodies in the serum. The highest, most uniform levels were in sows that were vaccinated on these two farms. High levels of antibody in the colostrum being given to piglets. And again, the highest, most uniform levels are on the vaccinated farms. But it does not interfere with the with the infection of the piglets, it does not cure viremia. Okay. So, so, so in summary, our analysis of the, the, the natural infection of pigs with circovirus is that it's a lifelong infection from the onset of life to the death of the animal. It's a viremic infection 
and it's maintained in the presence of PCV2 anti-capsid antibodies. This is a non-enveloped virus, so the capsid is what the pig sees. Pigs are making high amounts of antibody to that capsid, and it, and it does not seem to, and it's not curing infection, which is going to raise the question later on, how in the world can vaccines work, all of which are based on the presence of a capsid protein in, as, as the active material. So vaccines are able to induce an immune response that works better than the immune response generated by the pathogen itself. This is highly unusual in, in animal immunity. Okay. And again, so the data that support the statements here are the DNA levels in pigs from the time of birth to 25 weeks of age, and all of this viremia is being maintained in the presence of anti-capsid antibody levels. Okay. This is a data from a Danish study which emphasizes the fact that the circovirus vaccines provide wonderful protection against disease, but it is not by getting rid of viral infection. So here they were monitoring herds in a longitudinal study by PCR, taking young pigs and near market weight pigs every month. And you know, this is Denmark, so they're confirming that they have high health status, that these animals are safe to export to Russia. Oops, they forgot to vaccinate one batch, and it came back positive. So those, the assumption here is that all of these pigs are infected with circovirus, but these vaccines have an ability to control the infection, reduce the viremia levels below the sensitivity of the assays, but you take vaccines away, it comes right back. So the farrowing we've shown, we think, in 2006 and 2010, when some of the other studies were done, that the farrowing environment is heavily contaminated with PCV2. So growing pigs are under a constant viral challenge in the uterus, after birth, and from all of their playmates. The observation that is where you do not see viremia until 10 to 12 weeks of age, which was reported commonly in, in, in previous years, we think, we speculate, was due to the presence of maternal antibodies exerting some kind of control on infection so that it was not only subclinical but not detectable. And then as, as maternal antibody wanes, virus starts to multiply at higher levels, inducing an active immune response from the piglets. Okay. <clears throat> the NOM surveys are done every four to six years, and vaccines were introduced just as the previous NOM survey was being conducted. So, and it was becoming apparent that many labs were having difficulty detecting PCV2 and PCR assays from submitted samples. Uh, Andre Bro said, in Quebec. So, uh, uh, Bio, BioVet was, was one of the, the first diagnostic labs that I was aware of who, whose assay was so bad he could not find virus. Well, his assay wasn't bad at all. Uh, the, of course, our assay went to hell because we couldn't detect virus either. But then it turned out that, well, no one could. And so it appeared that viral loads in, in, in North American swine were on the decrease. Is it possible that vaccine was having an effect that you could observe over time, but not in individual experiments? So what, so what is the current or more current status of circovirus in U.S. swine herd? 
Well, in 2006, shown on the left here again, are the viral, the viral loads in pigs infected with 2A alone, 2B alone, or co-infected with A plus B. We see that in 2012, we still see 2A, we still see 2B. B is more abundant than, is, is more common than A. And co-infections, we still see the viral loads, on average, are 100 to 1,000 fold lower. This could be due to a lot of things, but the most logical is that this is a long-term effect of heavy vaccination of the entire swine population. So that if you have a, think about if you vaccinate the entire U.S. swine herd, it has a 10% effect in the next generation your starting load of virus is 10% lower. If you continue to exert a, a slow reduction over time, you will see this substantial cumulative effect. So the, and this, this shows up very clearly just in the positive negative results uh, from PCR assays. In 2006, about 83% of our samples, NOM samples were PCR positive, the remaining 17% PCR negative. In 2012, these have reversed. Most of our pigs now are PCR negative. Those that are positive, are the majority are near the level of sensitivity of the assay, which in our case is 300 to 500 copies per mil. Again, we, we, we remain interested in the immune response and the, and the induction of antibodies. And it's important now, when you have all of these PCR negatives, the question is, are they still infected or not? And we hypothesize that animals that are infected will make antibodies to the viral proteins, which primarily are capsid and the replicase. Okay? The animals which, make, which are not infected but vaccinated would only have antibodies to capsid because the vaccines do not contain the replicase. So we ran the anti-rep and anti-cap assays and found that 81% of the serum samples are rep positive, shown on the y-axis, and cap positive, shown on the x-axis. So these animals are infected and or vaccinated. But the presence of the rep, we conclude, as evidence of infection. Those animals that are, cap, that are rep negative, so rep would be below this horizontal red line, but cap positive are candidates for vaccine only. So these would be negative animals that had been vaccinated. Truly negative animals lacking rep and cap are in the lower left-hand quadrant. And animals which are rep positive and cap negative, we consider to be background noise because if they have rep truly, then they must have cap. And we exclude as trivial the possibility that they make antibodies to rep, which is not an abundant protein, and they do not make antibodies against CAP. Okay. So again, I show this data again to emphasize that vaccination appears to have an effect on, on suppressing viral loads, independent of its ability to prevent disease, and that over time, we are, we are reducing the environmental load of circovirus. So going forward, it's reasonable to expect that, that the ability to make circovirus negative animals could happen. Okay. And vaccines really do work. It's, this was a study done, I think, in Sweden, maybe Denmark, Christensen et al., a meta-analysis where they took every report they could find in any kind of publication, peer-reviewed, non-peer-reviewed abstract, that had data 
on growth performance and mortality performance in groups assessed at the same time. So good comparative valid studies. They showed a small positive effect, consistent positive effect on growth, a very dramatic positive effect reducing mortality. So the, the horizontal line would be no change in the two groups. Increased mortality in the treatment group would be in this diagonal. This is decreased mortality. As you, as you can imagine, herds that had very low mortalities to begin with, it's hard to show a benefit of vaccine. It suggests that this is the non-circle virus mortality caused level. And as you get increased mortalities in the absence of vaccine, the effect is more profound. So this ability of vaccines that contain capsid to reduce disease is really profound. And how it does it is a big mystery because the infection is also inducing anti-capsid antibodies. Okay, so no one really knows the mechanism. We have the, possi we have the likelihood that cell-mediated immunity is involved. You heard Dirk Whirling has a poster with, with data showing the impact with the CircleFlex vaccine. The infection induces a neutralizing antibody response. It's hard to imagine that a neutralizing antibody response would have no role at all, so that needs to be understood better. The cytotoxic T cells, the cell-mediated response, is not normally associated with vaccines that consist of killed products or, or individual protein products. But it's been noted that at least some of the vaccines, the capsid proteins appear to self-assemble into virion-like structures. And so if they're recapitulating the structural conformation of circovirus, it's possible that they are interacting effectively with T cells. And regardless of what the mechanism of action is, there really is this profound effect of, of circovirus vaccines. Okay. So PCV2 is highly conserved, in my opinion, in, in if you look at the totality of circoviruses in the U.S., at least, they're pretty much all the same. I used to argue that you had to be careful, 2A and 2B, they might be very different. I'm really struck by what seems to be very minor differences uh, in those two genotypes. Every dendrogram shows PCV2C, which is a single viral sequence from Denmark several years ago. The virus was never isolated. Nothing like it has ever been seen. We would be better off if we just treat it as a miracle. Miracles are things that happen one time so that we can't study those scientifically. And they have no impact on our behavior today. PCV2 is endemic in swine herds. PCV2B is more common than 2A. Exposure to circovirus and infection starts at birth and it's lifelong. And lastly, vaccination controls disease but does not eliminate infection.